Good evening. Welcome to ECCSC Live here on CAN TV. Today is a good day. Uh, we have a great show today, and I want to introduce to you all uh, Sister Amara Inya. We don't want to waste no time because I want the callers to call in to ask a question. Sister Amara is running for mayor of the city of Chicago. And uh, we need you all to call in and ask all the questions you can possibly uh, ask her in 30 minutes. And um, so we appreciate you all for tuning in today. So, Sister Mara, I will allow you to uh, introduce yourself at this time. Thank you, Sister, for coming. Thank you for having me on the show. Uh, so we have not uh, formally announced yet, but I did run in the previous election yes, uh, for mayor of Chicago. And there was a lot that was learned. Um, a lot that is still carrying over to what we're seeing today. So uh, since that time, I'm a public policy consultant. Um, I work uh, doing budget policy analysis, legislative analysis, working with community-based organizations, doing grassroots organizing, um, pretty much across the board on every policy area. Economic development is a big one for me. Yes. Education, housing, food security. Um, so pretty much every policy area I work in that area. Uh, I've worked in government uh, at the top level of city government. I've also worked in the private sector and I've worked uh, in the nonprofit sector. And so I've done everything from the top levels of government to the grassroots level and pretty much everything in between. And what is clear to, to me as we move into uh, 2019 and just really looking, looking ahead at the future of the city is that we're really at a, a special moment uh, mm -hmm. in the city where, and I'm, I'm hoping that people understand uh, the, the stakes are very high for what needs to happen in the city, especially as it relates to empowering communities to be self-sufficient and sustainable, uh, and to make sure that a lot of the issues that we've been organizing around for years uh, can be addressed, but it requires a different kind of leadership uh, in the city of Chicago. So, so yeah, that's, that's a great uh, start. Um, what I would like to say is about po policies. Um, candidates run for office but I, I don't see, I never see enough policy implications or suggestion how they will repair the last administration and, and if that's even possible. Yeah, so what, it, what is required is a vision for the city, as we're talking specifically about Chicago. I mean, this generally, but in Chicago it requires a vision, and that means we have to understand what the current circumstances are. And you'll see a lot of people talking about what's wrong in the city and what's wrong in the neighborhoods and what's wrong, and that's fine. But we have to take that next step to what is the alternative? What are we building? What are we creating? What, do we, what are we striving for? And that's where a lot of people miss the mark. My uh, getting into public policy as a profession was because for me, public policy is the mechanism through which we can ensure that every human being is able to live up to their potential. Uh, meaning that uh, if you believe, it, as I do, that everyone has a purpose to fulfill and that we have to create an environment for people to fulfill that purpose, that means they need to have access to quality schools, a quality, edu quality education. They need to be able to or should be able to uh, actualize who they are if they're in the arts. Yes. If they are wanting to get a job, they should be able to do that as a manifestation of purpose. That's what public policy means to me. Mm -hmm. And it's why I spent so much time working in, in the top levels of government because we see a disconnect between the policies that are created and how it affects those who are those who are mm -hmm. most affected by those policies. And so if we're about transforming lives and transforming communities, we have to have a deep understanding of what's currently wrong, especially from a policy standpoint, but also we have to be able to put forth, well, how do we do this better? How do we do this uh, in a way that is positive, in a way that is transformative? And that requires a vision. With that vision, we have given sight. So looking at you, it's like, okay, this is a black woman. She don't look like the typical candidate. <laughs> and it's like, um, do you think Chicago is ready to take a chance on a woman such as yourself who look like <laughs> you? Your educational background is great, but just on the visual side, do people do you see any um, uh, angst about that with people that when you walk around and meet, do they like believe that you can do that or can win if you do run? I think the people are definitely ready 
for a departure from the status quo. Yes. I, I recognize fully <laughs> that I'm not uh, the typical when you think about a politician. I'm, I'm a problem solver. Yes, ma'am. I'm a problem solver and I'm devoted to public service. Uh, and so everything about my life speaks to that. And I've also never been in a box. I don't yes. do boxes. So I very much recognize as a black woman uh, living on the west side of Chicago, uh, having, you know, I've done the educational thing. I have a PhD in education policy. I have a law degree. I have others that, but it's all about how you use those things in service of people. And so that to me is what I'm committed to. And it's about being authentic. This is just who I am. And so I believe that there, there's no need for me to reinvent myself or to present myself in a different way. I'm simply going to speak the truth as I see it through my lens. Mm -hmm. And if it resonates with people, then it does, right? Yes. If not, well, there are other options to choose from. But I do believe that people are ready for something different. They're ready for individuals who are not trying to just be something. They want, they're ready for individuals that are going to do something. And that requires an intimate knowledge of the city, of the communities. And it requires a, being genuine and yes. authentic about wanting to do the work. Yes, ma'am. Wanting to do the work, and that's what I'm committed to. We have a caller. Caller, uh, you have a question for Amara? Yes, sir. My name is Ray. I call every week. I want to say this, please. You know, this city here will let illegals vote pretty soon for locally, and yet they won't let ex cons. Now, there's something wrong with that. And, uh, the thing is, they'll let, you know what they tell you? They'll, tell, they'll let the uh, illegals go, they pay for them to go to trade schools, but they won't pay for ex con. What's wrong with Chicago? We have to do something, otherwise, crime is, is never going to get better, only worse. Let's fix it now. Let's get them people out of office and put the people. Oh, and the last, like last week, my friend said about they can vote anywhere else except here in Chicago as can. Well, let's put the people in there that'll change that. And they paid the uh, society. They should be able to vote. If illegals are able to vote, ex con should be able to vote. Thank you, Ray. They all right. Appreciate it, man. Thanks for your uh, call in every week. Uh, what I would like to say to that, and I would like to just listen to uh, your thoughts on it. Uh, how is it that when we're in prison, and this, this has to do, I believe, with the state as well as with the city in general, there's always funding to keep us housed. But when men return to society after serving their quote unquote debt to society, there's never enough funding or they have problems reintegrating because of the lack of this or the lack of that. Um, I was just wondering what you think about that on that point. And then the other point is, uh, as a mayor, because from what I'm understanding, and you might have greater history on this, is that um, as an ex-con, I can't even run for alderman if I have a felony even after I served my debt to society, but I can run for president of the United States. The highest office in the land, but locally, I can't affect change in my community. So to, to then I'm gonna answer your second question first. Yes. Um, we can always affect change, whether we're an elected official or not, yes, right? So I think what you're speaking to is just the, the idiosyncrasies of legislation and of the law, where you can run and be president, but you can't be alderman. Right. That's unique to the city of Chicago. And it's something that if we wanted to change it, we can push to change that law, right? Yes. I think once you have served your time, you that's it and that's all, and you should be able to serve uh, the public, yes, if right. that's what you so desire. Um, the other is just making sure that those who are returning citizens do understand their rights to vote, right, and the ability to vote, and being very clear about that so that they do not forfeit that right. Yes, um, to the first question, uh, as it relates to funding, it's a matter of priorities. So in the state of Illinois, for example, I believe the Department of Corrections, there was about $4 billion, mm -hmm. right, it's budgeted. Yes, so yes. we invest in incarceration. This is not just an Illinois problem. It is a nationwide issue that we are very willing to invest in in uh, 
incarceration as an industry, but in, but we are uh, it doesn't we don't see the same enthusiasm and investment as it relates to the, the conditions that would prevent individuals from even being incarcerated. So for me, that means investing in the economies and communities. And so one statistic that I put out there is there was a study that was done a few years ago that called uh, Million Dollar Blocks, and it essentially showed that in one block in Austin, and I work a lot of my work is on the west side. They the state spent a million dollars incarcerating individuals from one particular one block, block in, in the Austin community. If you look at the top communities, hundreds of millions of dollars are spent on incarcerating individuals. Who's the alderman in that block? That so I, I'm, I'm not sure with the re how the, uh, with the remap oh, yes. who because it could depend on the street. Yes. But the, that particular block, a million dollars is spent incarcerating individuals. And I say that to say, let's flip it and look at how many millions of dollars of investment, economic investment. And by that I mean, how have we invested in large scale development projects that will create economic vibrancy, that will create jobs, mm -hmm. that will create safer communities, that will create more sustainable communities. Let's look at, let's break down the numbers to how much is being invested. So what are our priorities? How much is being invested in schools in that community? I know uh, a few years ago when we closed schools, several of them were closed in Austin. Mm. So it is an issue of priorities. We have determined that we're willing to spend money on incarcerating individuals, whereas we actually have to be spending the money to invest in our biggest asset, which is our people, our human capital. Yes, that means economically empowering people, that means in education, that means in housing, it means in all of the things that create safe and sustainable communities. And if the leadership is committed to that, then we'll see a shift in how we're actually allocating our money. Excellent. We have another caller. Um, caller, have any questions for Amara? Um, hello, how you doing? Um, I'm a caller. I just wanted to ask a question. If I elect your official to, to, to change the law, and what I mean, like, once you serve your time, you come out, you have to still do probation or parole. Somehow they keep you still locked up in the system. you never free after serving your time. I don't care if you get expungement. They still somewhere found to keep it in the system. You get locked up to hold it against you to keep you up in your up in their system. If it could be some law, it shouldn't be that one man, the governor, has so much power to do it, and they don't even really do clemency. This holds us back from jobs. It holds our dads, and then when they get out from doing their time, they don't want them in the home. They must, it, it, it's to break up our family. So I just feel that the lack of fish could change the law. When you do your time, you serve your time. If you do your probation or your parole, you do something, lock them up again. Why is it that you got to wait 20 years and 15, 10 years, and you're still not guaranteed to get no pardon? So even a spongeman still holds you in the system, and it's just not fair to us. But if you somebody did, like political, the Jacksons, go to the Fed, they got money to pay. But somebody like us, we don't, our family's broken, we still broke, we get a good job, we get pulled over for anything because we have something in the system, they come to us whether we did it or not. Just the laws need to be changed. One law needs to be changed. You do your time after a certain amount of time. They do something, lock them up again. It Thank should be for bad parole. It's just too much. Change the law. Thank you, caller. Thank you, caller. Real okay, quick, you. Thank you, caller. Um, do you, let, let's let Amara ask answer that question. Yeah, I mean, I, I completely understand the frustration. When you come out of the system, the, that's not even, the that's just the beginning of the battle. It's the issue of finding housing, it's the issue, of, we haven't even talked about finding work. Um, all of the things that would create stability so that you don't go back in, right? Yes. And that's been the challenge. And so it is about changing the law, number one, but it's also about changing all of the infrastructure around individuals that are coming back into communities. Yes, um, I talk always about economic justice because that's a key component of it. You have to be able to sustain yourself when you're in your community. You have to be able to find housing. You have to be able to find a job. And so our policies have to reflect that. And there has to be concerted effort to make sure that we're not essentially creating a hostile environment for people who are trying to come back into their community. So that requires a change in law, but it also requires individuals who are committed to that, who yeah. recognize that an inclusive economy, for example, includes those who do may have had a record, and how do we make sure that they're brought into the fold? Yeah, I'll hold my comment on that uh, parole process because I'm dealing with it myself currently, constantly fighting that thing. Um, Carla, you have a question for Mara? Hello. Hello. 
Hi, so I've been listening to the program and I heard your guest say that she is a public policy specialist. And so I just wanted to get her assessment on what have been some of the major policy failures of the current mayoral administration. How much time do we have? Um, no, I'm just kidding. I'm just, I'm just kidding. Uh, thank you for your question. I would say one of the biggest issues that has that I've been really advocating on is around again this issue of economic justice. We can look at the micro level, which is just the fact that the city is essentially sustaining itself on tickets, fines, fees, and forfeitures, which disproportionately hurt uh, lower income communities. Mm. So whenever you get a ticket on your car or a boot on your car, um, those that is not a sustainable way of operating a city and supporting a city and so there's that issue the other issue is the significant um, population loss we have lost at least in the black community 250,000 fewer black people in the city of Chicago mm. what that means is not just people are not here it means our local businesses cannot be supported because you don't have the people in the neighborhood to, to generate the foot yes. traffic to support them right. it means we're not getting the property tax revenue which would sustain the city which means we won't have to rely on tickets fines and fees uh, it means so many things. It means the erosion of our political power as well. So that's a huge issue. The other is a study that came out that showed that the majority of the jobs that were created in the city, the mayor touts that we have uh, created all of these jobs, but a huge percentage, they're not coming to individuals who live in our communities. Mm -hmm. They're not coming to people from the neighborhoods. A lot of it is attracting headquarters and they're bringing in essentially importing employees. And so we are not creating jobs like we mm -hmm. should. Um, that's just on the economic front. I can go into what's happening in education uh, and how do we make sure that we have a quality school system where we're not um, closing schools unnecessarily, where we're not displacing or destabilizing in communities where we have education policy that actually treats everyone as as that they should be entitled to a high quality education regardless of the neighborhood they live in um, that's just a, a couple of uh, the issues I mean I can run the gamut I talk about changing ex expanding the economic ecosystem we need to be talking about cooperative economic models we need to be talking about how we're going to get access to the things that build wealth how we're going to create home ownership business ownership in our communities how we're not going to get displaced from our communities those are the issues that I would address and before we close out um, why do you think you are qualified for one or and shall I say for two more qualified than any other mayor or candidate running or that will be announcing their candidacy so the I could talk about my background I've mentioned in the beginning of the show I've worked in the top levels of government I've worked at the grassroots level I've worked as an organizer I have the educational background the policy expertise um, but the biggest factor is the desire to serve mm -hmm. and for me this is less about me telling people why I'm the one and more about standing in truth speaking the truth and letting the people decide what is in their best interests uh, for the city of Chicago and so I put it back on the people this is a unique time that we're in the stakes are very high um, for me, this is a pivotal moment in the history of Chicago. And if we don't move in a different direction, there will be implications that extend for generations. Mm -hmm. And so my responsibility is to convey that urgency and to stand in the truth, in at least the truth as I see it. But the people will ultimately decide which person represents what they want. So we shouldn't be saying, I'm for you. They should say, this is the candidate that actually resonates with me that when I hear them, it speaks to something in me. And I think the people will respond um, positively. Excellent, excellent. Do we have a caller? Do we have a caller online? Okay, thank you. Um, what I would like to then do is get back to that first question, or was it the third question from the caller with the parole process? Mm -hmm. um, I myself has, a, has experienced that and it's like gruesome, right? Even after you've done, no matter what you do to the, for the community, how you serve the community, how you go to work, how you take care of your family, you still go through the hustle and bustle of that process. If you move, you have to stay in touch with the mm -hmm. parole. So it's, it's just a constant state of influx, like incarceration, perpetual incarceration, even after you've done all you can do. Uh, for yourself and your family. you have anything further to say on that? Well, it's, it's difficult. I, so 
And how will we change that? And how could we change that? Well, part of it, me, is, is about creating creating entry points to where you can live as n a normal life. And so when I think about a normal life, it's going to the store, it's going to church, it's going to school, it's moving about, it's going to the park, all of those things that anyone would want to do. And so if the goal and if our goal is to prevent people from, from pre prevent recidivism, right? If we want people to be very much integrated into their communities and to not go back into the system, our responsibility is to create an environment where they can do so. Yes, so that means having access to housing, right? It means having access to a job. It means getting rid of the red tape. I mean, with a lot of individuals that I know, especially in my neighborhood who are coming out of the system, it's just the red tape. It's the, it's the runaround. It's the, the, the stress of go here, go there, mm -hmm. check in here. I mean, it's, it's a lot. You for check a into a computer and you have to check into a physical person. Right. So, so it's, it's, <laughs> it's a lot. It's more than any, you know, anyone would want to have to do. And so as we think about policies that make sense, it is about streamlining processes. It's about easing transition back into, into society. It's about not creating hurdles that you have to jump over just to do the day-to-day, -day, right? Mm -hmm. um, that's the lens that I have as someone who, who empathizes because I know what I would want to do and what I wouldn't want to do. And again, we have to create an environment where it, it's, it's not easier to just let things slip and go back into the system. We want people to stay in their communities and to be thriving citizens. That's right. Carla, you have a question for Mara? Carla, you have a question for Mara? Yes. Hi, guys. I'm back on one more time because this sensitive to me because I am an ex-offender. I do live in a good environment, have a good job. But this stigma, I work for the city, but this stigma, I'm, in a, I'm not in a hostile environment, but I still get harassed through my job because I get pulled over and I ain't been in trouble over 15 years. It's hard to see to get the clemency. My record is sealed up and I still go through hell. So how can we change the law once we do our time, how can we change from this one governor so we can be pardoned? After 15 years or 10 years, come on now. Yes, ma'am. All this good stuff that you said, I did it, and I still get harassed all the time. So I think that's why organizations like yours, Tyrone, are so important, because this is the ground-level advocacy work that's necessary to put pressure on those who represent us to actually advocate for the policies and the laws that will serve our interests. So we can't have, it can't just be one person fighting alone or one person going down to whomever's office. It has to be collective, right? Yes, so your organization does that. It's about moving collectively. It's about I believe in grassroots level policy making, meaning the people know what they need. Like the caller, she knows what she needs. Yes. So now it's just about banding together with other folks who have a similar experience because she's not on her own. There are many people who have that experience. And then putting pressure on those who say that they serve our interests to actually, whether it's changing laws or just changing policy, or actually voting people out when they've, when they've shown that they are resistant to change. So tomorrow, before we close out, um... Would you like to, a last statement and leave the people your information where they can help you or help you decide whether or not you're <laughs> running? Or <laughs> well, for any, uh, for the viewers, and again, thank you yes. for having me. Um, they can go to the website. It's amaraenya.com, A-M-A-R-A-E-N-Y-I-A.com. And on every social media platform, it's Amara Enya. Not only do we have just the current events, but we break down, I break down a lot of policy that's going on. On. Um, I'm try to speak the truth as to the issues that we're facing. You will have a sense of the, what the vision is for the city. And if you just want to learn more, you're just curious, um, that's the, the place to go. And as always, people, thank you for tuning in to ECCSC Live. Um, please, ECCSC.info or give us a call, 708-677-8178. Thank you for tuning in, and we uh, hope to see you next week. We'll see what guests we'll have uh, in store for you. Peace, and uh, take care.